Good morning and welcome to Revive FM. We're live from our studios in London near the Olympic Stadium in the east end of the glorious city and I welcome you, your host, Ali Fateh. And on the breakfast show today, we're going to be talking to, interviewing our headline guest, Ms. Radha Sterling, the CEO of a human rights organization called Detained in Dubai, describing themselves with their mission to ensure the security of foreign nationals in the Middle East and the Gulf in particular, and to protect them from unjust detention, wrongful persecution, prosecution, and all other violations of their human rights. They also aim to promote reforms in the region that will contribute to the stability of the lives and interests of the expat community who reside in that region. We're going to discuss a matter of issues. Um, amongst them, we've been building up on this show, ladies and gentlemen, on Revive FM. The last couple of weeks, the point of interest being the Middle East and the focus of a lot of our discussions, primarily as a result of interest from our listeners. So we thank you very much that you've shown a a rise of interest, particularly in this region. Of course, in the backdrop, we're all still living with the reality of some form of a lockdown during the ongoing pandemic. And whilst we're there, I guess, the kind of feedback we're getting is that people's interest in some of the news items in the Middle East has also been spurred in some part by discussion of a new Middle East, a new future, a new, a new path can be hoped for, particularly as many generations, and my generation in particular, all we've known from the Middle East is turmoil, conflict, and an ongoing stage in theatre where world events primarily have been influenced by many of the factors of the Middle East, primarily the juxtapositioning of of in certain cases, democracies, one democracy in particular, which is the state of Israel, which is surrounded by dictatorships, theocracies in some cases, but also oil-rich kingdoms. And oil-rich kingdoms in particular in the Gulf have been at the focus of little world attention, primarily because the Abraham Accords have been signed, ladies and gentlemen, spearheaded by the U.S. President Donald Trump, and many would say brokered by the one and only Mr. Tony Blair, who in the background has facilitated this, as reported by the Haaretz newspaper from Israel. Whilst the Abraham Accords seeks to bring together former adversaries, into paving a path for a future of trade, commerce, international relations, which for many people was almost unimaginable. Times do change, ladies and gentlemen, but one thing that hasn't really moved that much with the times is some of the human rights and some of the basic laws and fundamental protections that should be offered to all citizens in the Middle East. And we've talked about it a little bit on our shows on the breakfast hour in uh, on Revive FM. However, today we're going to speak to Ms. Radha Sterling, who has first-hand experience and is at the front line of defending the rights and promoting justice and advocating for a different approach, particularly in the Middle East. Good morning, Radha. Good morning, Ali. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a great pleasure of ours, and we'd like to welcome you. Obviously, I've introduced you as a, as a human rights activist and an advocate for protecting the rights of those, probably the voiceless, in the Middle East and the Gulf states in particular, but also not just the voiceless, but just the disenfranchised. Tell us a little bit rather about your life journey and how you came to actually focus on protecting the rights of those individuals in, in what many would regard as the most volatile part of the world, not only legally, but in terms of international law, is a bit of a, 
a, a mystery for us, particularly those who are living outside the region? Certainly. Um, I mean, I I was working with Endemol a lot back in um, back in the day, in around 2007, and one of my colleagues, uh, who I worked closely with, and he was a friend, had travelled to Dubai, and uh, he'd been arrested and accused of having uh, specks of uh, marijuana dust at the bottom of his bag, and he he faced several years in prison. So. Uh, no one was really helping him. No one knew what to do. No, none of his friends, none of the groups. And we were sort of learning along the way, how, how can we help this guy? And it was at that point we got in touch with some lawyers. We, we got in touch with the embassy. We started a really large campaign for him. And it was backed by Endemol, which is a you know, television giant, which was very helpful. Um, and, and I led that campaign and learned a lot throughout that experience. And ultimately, his release was facilitated. But during that time, it was really, I think, for the UAE, it was the first time that someone had been arrested and it had become a massive international media spectacle. The, the whole injustice of it, the fact that they didn't have evidence, procedures, all sorts of violations of what you would expect in a normal situation with due process. And that had all come to the light of, of media all over the world, in, in UK, in Australia, it was on television, it was on breakfast shows. And we, we had a website, all sorts of things. And it was really that that was the catalyst for this organization. Once he got home, and we got him home in about seven weeks, and this is someone who, who really we thought was going to face years in jail, but the campaign facilitated his release. There were interventions from the government of the UAE. They didn't want the negative press, and um, he was sent home. But it was because of his case, and when he came home, he went on television. It was everywhere again and talking more in depth about it. But other people saw this campaign, other, other people that were in the same situation. They'd been arrested. There was no evidence. There were no charges. But they were being prosecuted regardless. And they saw we developed this website called Detain in Dubai, and they contacted us and said, can you help us as well? You managed to get your friend home. Surely you can repeat whatever you did to get him home uh, and help us in this situation. So it was then that I realized, you know, this wasn't an isolated event. And it was happening quite frequently. I was starting to get these emails, you know, once or twice a week. And considering we weren't an organization, it was just a single website and a single case. But we were getting so many inquiries that I realized perhaps this is something that I can really help with. I already had a sort of formula worked out. Okay, I only had one case, but it was successful. That's 100% success. Um, but we... We kept working, well, I kept working, and I kept learning, and I, you know, spoke to the, the lawyers in the UAE a lot and trained up with them and asked them to send me books on the UAE law or anything that I could learn to help these people. And uh, it, I just kind of fell into it naturally. I was still working with Endemol. I, I had a, a media business and, and sort of supported them working on a lot of their television shows. And I just eventually crossed over to working full-time uh, for for my organization and it was it was just a natural evolution and after about a year we started getting you know the the big cases because we had the 2008 2009 financial crash a lot of people you know were caught up in the fallout of that and they were being jailed for bounced checks and there were all sorts of you know entrepreneurs investors debtors that were going to prison over this uh, economic crisis and that's when, you know, we really started to just open the floodgates as far as, in, you know, new clients in need of assistance and unfair detentions. Uh, and we had uh, a lot of media interest at that point as well. It was like, as soon as Kat LaHoy's case came to light, and this is my friend, as soon as his case was in the media, it was just case after case after case. And the press really developed a hunger to expose these kind of injustices that people just hadn't even considered. At that point, Dubai had really marketed itself as you know, a very, very modern city and uh, people were just enjoying themselves. There, were, there was not really any human rights violations, so to speak, of against foreign nationals, but they just started escalating and, and Westerners started visiting the country and with the media developing an interest in those cases of injustice in the Middle East, it, that's when it really becomes an issue for the UAE. So... Um, 
so that's 12 years ago now. So we've been um, going going strong and developing more and influencing more changes in the region. And we've dealt with, and this is several years ago now, it was in excess of 10,000. So now we're post 15,000 um, cases that we've actually dealt with over the past 12 years. And that's, you know, it's everything from people being arrested for wearing a an offensive Qatar t-shirt or a prescription medicine or poppy seeds on the bottom of the shoe and then we have you know the real debtors crisis we have you know the abuse of employees we have uh, extortion cases or um, business cases uh, you know entrepreneurs being used as scapegoats so that local business partners can just steal the entire you know, cash and assets of that business and profit from it. And we've had, you know, women's cases. You've probably seen a lot of the Princess Latifah case. We've had uh, rape victims being jailed for sex outside marriage. So we've dealt with a whole range of issues over the past 12 years. And we are seeing some changes in the way that the UAE deals with it. But um, it's going to be very interesting over the next 10 years, I think, to see how the UAE evolves, how the neighboring countries evolve, and how the Israel deal affects those changes. That's really succinct, uh, rather. Um, obviously, for for a lot of our listeners, um, you can imagine they have um, they have connections and with relatives and friends uh, and who've lived in the in the Middle East and particularly in in the United Arab Emirates. And um, I've, I'm getting a text coming in here. I've just <laughs> I've got to answer it because. What it is is that uh, your your group is not an entity which is a one-sided entity. Uh, I, th- I think, it's for the record, as stated on your website, rather, um, I think you'll agree with me. Um, you that it, it states that you endeavour to have more of an international visibility and pressure um, applied in this region, so it can lead to faster reform, and so that the United Arab Emirates can become a mutually and culturally respectful an international meeting point for all of us. I think that's quite nicely put, um, just to dispel any, any, anyone who has sort of comments thinking it, it's, it's a one-sided affair. Um, obviously, what you've just stated there is, is your organization is then not only for those who don't have a voice to represent themselves, but also those who've been disenfranchised in, in the sense that they've, they've led very comfortable and very uh, lucrative lifestyles in in the UAE, but for no fault of their own, without any any forewarning, they end up falling on the wrong side of the law. And this is the part which I hope our listeners can um, can get to grips with. You know, when people are kind of cushioned with living in a democracy, in a developed democracy such as the United Kingdom and elsewhere in Europe, and of course, United States and Canada, it's very hard to imagine what, when you when you step set foot into a region such as the UAE and uh, Dubai in particular, where there's a great disparity between the reality which is there, which is a conservative um, Arab culture embedded in the desert, basically, with a tradition, with a history which not only deep-rooted with religious values, with with, with what many would say is um, anachronistic uh, legal codes, but the f- the facade is the glitz and the glamour, which almost gives a veneer of Western, uh, for lack of a better phrase, but the, the veneer of, of a lifestyle which you can, you can have over here. You can have all the perks of what you could have had in the United Kingdom or the United States or Europe or Canada, but you can have it here in Dubai. But that is the pitfall which, unfortunately, a lot of people have, um, have succumbed to. And I guess... Um, because the organization has been in, in the news a lot, um, I thought I'd just run this past you, rather, so you see what you think about this, what we're going to discuss today. And many of the things that you've, you've sort of touched upon um, publicly, it's, uh, it's, it's been widely reported in the media, and you have been quite vocal in, in appearing on several news outlets um, across the United States. Uh, in particular, f- I was interested to see you on Sean Hanrity's uh, um, Fox <laughs> News, which is, which, is, which is great because it shows a bit of diversity there of, of the subject matter, um, but also obviously the traditional news networks, the BBC and CNN and ABC, NBC, etc. I thought we'll just go through something and see what you think about this. The, the interest basically is, 
in, in the recent, um, recent couple of weeks, which not only um, has, has, has made your sort of public profile more kind of profile, but you've actually been very vocal in, for example, in, in your blog you stated that Dubai is the most treacherous place in the world to do business. And all I can think of is that must be driving them crazy over there, the authorities, with, with them trying to rebuild and sort of revamp a public uh, image for the international um, potential investors. You have uh, a human rights advocate such as yourself based in London and, and with the ear and, and, uh, and the voice to actually state these things. How's that gone down, brother? Well, I mean, that's an interesting one. The, um, the UAE has been really trying very hard to attract foreign investment for the past 10 years. And especially in times like this, we're facing economic crisis. They're going to have to step up their marketing and, again, attract those entrepreneurs and investors back into the country. And they've been doing this by uh, Ras al Khaimah, for example. They were very aggressive in marketing um, their offshore um, structures to American companies. And they did attract quite a few large-scale investors into the region. And we have, again, Dubai's competing with Ras al Khaimah on that level as well, uh, mar marketing sort of, um, you know, company facilities where people can go there and they don't have to have a local sponsor and that kind of thing. But And, and marketing the region, really, as you come, come to the UAE, you're, you're probably going to find some partners here, some investors. You're going to be able to sell to a new market, expand whatever it is you're selling abroad and, and open up to the Gulf. It's, it's a, the perfect hub for any American business, European business who wants to expand into the uh, region but wants to work in kind of a modern city. They don't really want to go to Saudi. They want Dubai. Dubai is more like the West and it and absolutely seems that way. So... The, the fact that um, they've increased their marketing is, has not been sufficient because what they need to do along with that, that plan, and it's a good plan, yes, they do need to attract entrepreneurs and investors, but they need to protect them at the same time or they're going to constantly be in this battle where it's, um, okay, attract the investors, we've got the investors, they come there and then suddenly they're going to have more negative press criticising what's happened to those investors and it's going to get bigger and bigger because the more they attract, and they're going to attract, you know, celebrity types and, and high-profile individuals, it's not just going to be uh, nobodies, essentially. And so, so far, they've got, a, got away with that. But if they attract any large-scale companies, large-scale, you know, entrepreneurs who have a bit of a following and they end up in, in trouble, then that's really going to negatively impact the UAE. And for every you know, 10 marketing points we assign to them. Oh, they've, they've, done, they've invested millions into marketing here and PR agencies and business lobby groups. But then they get one case like Andre Gautier, which shows how someone can be scapegoated and how they can end up in prison. And we've had Safi Qureshi and, and all sorts of uh, entrepreneurs over the past 10 years. But you get these high-profile Western uh, investors and entrepreneurs who end up in prison and they undo all of the UAE's marketing investment. And it just doesn't actually make business sense from the UAE's end. So, yes, they need to, along with the marketing, along with the PR, they actually need to develop a legal strategy to protect investors because there aren't those safeguards that we'd expect. It's still, the legal system is still the same as it was, essentially, um, 12 years ago when we started this organization and when we talked about um, these issues. Nothing much has changed. They've, they've spoken about bankruptcy laws because if someone goes into business in the UAE and they're not paid for whatever, you know, they, they were expecting payment from the government, a, a construction company, for example, and with that money they pay their suppliers, they pay their staff. Now, if they're defaulted on, and it could be the government entity that defaults on a payment, um, they're not going to be able to meet their own obligations and that can cause them as individuals to end up in prison because uh, bounce checks are a criminal offence in Dubai and each check can warrant up to three years in prison. So you can see how really easy it is for someone to end up in jail simply, and, and for no, through no fault of their own. Obviously, they didn't intend to uh, default on, on any payments. They perhaps met all of their bank obligations, but they've ended up in prison through no fault of their own. Now, that kind of damage 
to the reputation of the UAE is going to scare investors away from the country until it's repaired. Now, they installed these bankruptcy laws to uh, counter that and to just... Sorry, you're getting a bit of a ding there. Um, they installed bankruptcy laws to counter uh, this, this reputation. They were hoping that in, in making a big public relations effort about um, bankruptcy laws that investors would feel safe. But these bankruptcy laws didn't apply to the majority of expats. And so it, it encouraged people and it confused people. And we, we had a lot of inquiries. Oh, am I safe now? Am I going to end up in prison? These bankruptcy laws, are they, are they going to protect me? And the answer was no. And even their own legal teams in the UAE have criticised them for the bankruptcy laws. So there's still no protection in the UAE as far as investors and business people going there and ending up in this legal system that's still chaotic and is still the same as it was really and has been for the past 20, 30 years. Incredible. Um, this is such fascinating material, Rada, um, and we've got so many questions to ask you. We'll do that just after the short break. Ladies and gentlemen, join us after the short break, and we'll rejoin our headline guest, Ms. Rada Sterling of Ten Dubai. The new NHS COVID-19 app immediately shows me the risk of coronavirus in my area, so I can warn Mel. It lets me quickly check into venues with a QR scanner, so I can protect Alid. It tells me fast if I've been in contact with other app users who have coronavirus, so I can alert Emma. It helps me protect all my loved ones, even Andy Sue. The more of us who get the app, the better we can control coronavirus. Protect your loved ones. Get the NHS COVID-19 app. Download now at Google Play or the App Store. Through Minhaj Welfare Foundation, your giving saves lives. Your support has provided more than 3 million people with access to clean and safe water. Emergency relief in natural disaster and crisis-affected areas around the world. Supported orphans and needy children with a better future. This year, your help can do more. Donate your zakat, sadka, and charitable donations to any of your chosen projects. Call us now, 0300-3030-777, or visit us on minhajwelfare.org. Rosia Plumbing, the boiler specialists. We do new boiler installations, full house central heating systems, underfloor heating, boiler repairs, boiler servicing and gas safety certification for landlords. With some of the best prices in town, there's no job too big or too small for our qualified engineers. For a free, no obligation quote, contact us now on 07956282948. Rosia Plumbing, the boiler specialists. Minhaj School. School of Islamic Sciences provides quality Islamic education for children aged between 5 and 15 years old, as well as teaching classical Islam including Tajweed, Fiqh, Sirah and Aqidah, we endeavour to equip children with essential Islamic manners, morals and values. Here at MSIS, our experienced teachers create an inspirational learning environment where we strive to cater for the needs of every child. For enrolment inquiries, inquire in person at Minhaj School of Islamic Sciences, Monday to Friday, 5 to 7 p.m at 292-296 Rumford Road or email admin.edu underscore london at minhajuk.org Super Best Meze Grill The Turkish restaurant where all our food is prepared to perfection Our mixed grill family platters include lamb shish, chicken shish, adana kebab, lamb ribs, chicken donna, lamb donna, chicken wings and lamb chops and all are served with rice, salad along with a selection of our cold mezes To see our full menu go to superbestmezegrill.com co.uk for the perfect dining setting visit us now at 21 to 23 broadway stratford e15 4b or call 0208 555 35 super best meze grill this is a message from the government the law has changed you must self-isolate if you test positive for coronavirus or are told to self-isolate by nhs test and trace if you do not you risk a penalty of a thousand pounds or more testing and isolating are vital to stopping the spread of coronavirus because this is so important, the government is now providing financial support for those who need it whilst self-isolating. You could be eligible for a £500 support payment if you're on low income and are unable to work because you're self-isolating. Find out if you're eligible at gov.uk slash coronavirus. Break the cycle of infection, not the law. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. If you want to advertise your business on Revive FM, then visit www.revivefm.co.uk. 
Alternatively, contact our sales team now on 07944 565616. That's 07944 565616. Revive FM 94.0 on the radio, on your mobile, and online. Welcome back to Revive FM, and uh, let's resume our very interesting discussion we're having with our headline guest, Ms. Rada Sterling, of detained in Dubai, a human rights activist and a promoter of reform and change, particularly in the United Arab Emirates. Um, Rada, thanks for staying on there, and it's interesting uh, what you just stated in terms of how business is um, is conducted in in the in the UAE, a lot of people, as as I mentioned a bit earlier, because people from the Indian subcontinent um, in particular have this very very uh, glossy idea of of, uh, of the Middle East in general. Uh, I guess it's been like a, a default destination in the sense that whilst many seek um, better pastures uh, through through um, through previous generations of emigration uh, to the United Kingdom or to the United States, Canada, uh, amongst other countries, um, there has been a sort of a later uh, development, particularly in line with how uh, the United Arab Emirates has developed in the 70s and 80s, where people went in two categories. And this, these are the categories where I find very, um, very bizarre. There are those who are already established um, entrepreneurs and uh, business folk, uh, men and women, who feel that Dubai is, a, is an ideal destination for them to, to be based. And then you have the other category of unskilled workers, laborers, who triple, in some cases quadruple, their domestic salaries in, in whichever country they're from, whether it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and head to the Middle East for, for work, which in, sen- in, in one sense uh, makes their life better. But the disparity, rather, which I wanted to talk to you about, and I think a lot of our listeners are very curious about is how is it that the United Arab Emirates can can treat entrepreneurs from the same part of the world, same part of the world who bring money into the Middle East, with a with a similar disdain, <laughs> in a way, because they don't respect the human rights, uh, they don't respect uh, protecting the rights of businesses, and 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 have got extreme business practices, um, which if if they're broken, then the law is really uh, going to tumble upon their heads. And yet, the same lack of respect is given to the common labourer. How is that, rather, where the people from the, from the Indian subcontinent have this great question mark as to if countries in the Middle East, in particular UAE and Dubai in particular, if they actually have this disdain of people who either come in with, with capital and building um, the UAE, and many would say there's a big argument apart from the services sector which has been based primarily around um, the United Kingdom and the United States and Canada offering uh, the, the tech and the service industry for, uh, for the region but the actual um, volume of material wealth and and money and financing as well as as manpower has come from the Indian subcontinent. Rather, from your perspective as someone not from the Indian subcontinent yourself, why is there that disdain? Well, I think, I mean, I, I've thought about this a lot actually, and I think that we see this kind of disdain coming from the very top layers of the UAE. So that's from the rulers and down. And the, the rulers, some, some of them, like uh, Sheikh Saud of Ras al he is in a little precarious position where he doesn't feel stable in his rule in that emirate. And he needs the support of local tribes and he's constantly seeking to gain that. So how does he gain that? He gains it by allowing them a little bit more power than any normal society would. So the people who are below him, his friends, his family, their extended families, the, the, the people with um, influence and power in the UAE and the Emiratis are afforded this kind of position where they can exploit other people, they can exploit foreign nationals 
for sure, without legal consequence. They have a sense of impunity, immunity, definitely legal immunity. Um, so if they commit a crime, essentially, against a foreign national and it benefits them and, uh, you know, it could be for financial reasons or it could be for personal reasons, they're still not going to end up um, at, the, at the end of a lawsuit in the UAE and lose it. So if there were a lawsuit against them, they, would, they certainly wouldn't be losing it. And that gives them this power to essentially do what they want. And that filters down throughout society, that attitude. So it's starting right at the top and it's filtering all the way down. And this is an age-old cultural thing. And, you know, they, they've only just started bringing in all of these foreign investors, the Westerners and, and certainly the, uh, the workers as well on the sub-Indian continent. I mean, they're bringing them all in to construct this country, but they haven't considered, okay, these are people not to be exploited, these are people helping us and we should reward them and treat them with dignity and respect. No, because they're looking to impress their Emirati network, perhaps their extended families, so we're talking Saudi families as well, and at the expense of foreigners, at the expense of Westerners, at the expense of Filipinos and, uh, and, and Indians. So this, is, this, this attitude is not just against um, entrepreneurs and, and business people, it's against the workers as well. And it's an overall attitude and it doesn't change based on the work that that person is doing. So on the one hand, you see um, people coming in with millions of dollars and the Emiratis thinking, oh, I'll, I'll keep that. Thank you for that investment. I will keep that. And the way that they keep it is, I mean, th th this one happens a lot, is that they, they'll partner up with this, this foreign national and they will withdraw money from the company or they'll create some elaborate sort of um, accounting facade and then they will accuse that partner of theirs, that foreigner, of a crime such as embezzlement when in fact it was them who took the, the, the Emirati who withdrew the money themselves and that is clearly evidenced through banks and through you know, written evidence. However, there's nothing that the foreigner can do. He's been accused of embezzlement and that, that's the issue with the legal system and due process in the UAE is that there isn't any. So if an Emirati accuses a Westerner or a foreigner of stealing money from the company, it doesn't matter about the evidence. It matters about their influence within society in the UAE. And if they're an influ influential person, they're going to have access to whatever justice they want to have access to. And the foreign national is not going to have that same justice. And the same can be said for the migrant workers. They're brought over, they're exploited, they're, they're promised conditions that they're not delivered. Uh, some of them are in the most horrendous conditions, they're not paid. And especially, I mean, we're looking at coronavirus situation at the moment and, you know, the last economic crisis as well. So we've brought these people over. They're working pretty cheaply as far as what we could and should technically be paying them for this job. Um, and then in, in coronavirus times where, you know, the companies are, and the individuals, they're defaulting on payment of these workers and these workers sometimes have debts to pay. And, you know, they might have had to take out a small credit card debt with a, a local bank in uh, Dubai and they're not going to be able to pay that if their employer defaults on them. And that can send them into a situation where their visa expires their passport is confiscated, they're not allowed to work, they, they can't renew their visa, and they can never, therefore, repay that debt to the bank. And the debt to the bank may be very small. It may be $5,000, $10,000. Um, but they'll never be able to repay it, and therefore they can't even leave the country if they want. So they can end up in this situation where they're homeless and vulnerable to exploitation. Now, this happens a lot with uh, subcontinent workers and Filipinas as well. If they get into the slightest amount of debt, and often they have to, simply because they haven't been paid by their employer. Now, even $2,000, $3,000 can equal a travel ban for them, and they can end up in this terrible cycle where, they can't, where they're not technically allowed to work, but they can't leave the country either. And some of them have arrived in the UAE and said, oh my God, these conditions are certainly not what we were told, um, but they can't leave. They're in a contract. If they break that contract, you know, it's it's like they're owned by their employer. And if they try to break their contract, their employer might get vindictive about it and they might fabricate an allegation against that person just to keep them in the country. They can walk down to the police station and simply say, this person has insulted me 
and that will be enough for the police to take out criminal uh, prosecution against that individual. So they have this kind of access to the police and access to the legal system that you simply don't have access to in a country like the UK. And I think people who go to the UAE don't understand that. What they, what they believe is that if they go to the UAE and they follow the letter of the law and they're respectful and they're polite and, you know, and they just do the right thing, that they'll be okay. They don't understand that there's this underlying um, system and, and cultural system that allows people to do what they want. So if, if they go to the country and they, they get away with it and they come home and they're safe, well, that's all well and good. But if anything happens to cause another person to want to manipulate the system against them, they're going to be completely vulnerable and they can end up in prison. And, and of course, um, there have been many cases that you've... Um, you've highlighted and you've brought it to the attention not only of the authorities rather but uh, just for our listeners to understand that um, you've actually taken the authorities on head on basically and called them out on many of the uh, blatant uh, abuses and violations of treaties and in, in several cases just basic um, basic human rights which are being violated um, I just wanted to ask you this question here rather now Getting a, uh, a comment here, basically saying about how the the, <laughs> the Middle East uh, or Islamic countries and very commas uh, are very hospitable, and th this goes against basically the conversation we're going. Well, I, I just had to say here to, um, to, our, to our commentator here, the I've been to Dubai, on, uh, well, the Middle East in, uh, on several occasions, and the UAE and Dubai on, on on many occasions, and the one thing that's hit me is. There's no hospitality there. It's not a hospitable place. And I'm just saying on the basis of just traveling, putting religion and culture and everything aside, it's not the kind of place which welcomes you and embraces you to come and have a look, come and see us, come and, come and feel a bit of our culture. And it's, a, it's almost like this is what we've given for you. Come and enjoy it. Um, spend your money. Or if you're on holiday, then enjoy the place. But... We are not going to go out of our way to make you feel welcome. Um, what do you make of that, brother? Well, that's, that's an interesting one. I, I think that most of the clients that we've dealt with, and particularly the business ones, have gone with that same attitude, that it really is hospitable. You know, they, they meet wonderful Emiratis, and um, they're invited into their families. You know, for, first thing is, you know, come, come to dinner, come to our wedding. You know, you really feel like you are a family member, but if things turn bad or that person just doesn't want to deal with you anymore or they see that they can extract or extort funds from you, well, suddenly that friendship is over. So that's what we see time and time again uh, in most of our cases. So as, as far as hospitality, um, I don't think a country could ever be seen to be hospitable when we have this underlying legal system that's open to abuse and that you're, you are relying on their kindness to not to not protect, well, you're relying on their kindness to not end up in jail, that's not a very hospitable country. And if you have, you, someone else believes that you've offended them and they can just snap their fingers and put you in jail, that is not hospitality. And I don't think that we could at all be honest and say that the UAE is hospitable if we are at that great risk of, of going to prison and we're at their mercy. And if anything happens, all we have to rely upon in that situation is that hopefully um, the international media will put enough pressure on the government that they will intervene in this situation and believe that it's better to have us out of the country than not. And then you come into, you know, you have to look at the racism issue in the UAE as well, and there definitely is a hierarchy. That, that's very obvious. Everyone knows about the hierarchy. It's you know, obviously Emiratis first and then other Gulf nations and then, you know, certain foreign nationals and then right down the bottom are the, the migrant workers and everything that they just don't care about. And you, you have to look at the fact that the, the media is very interested in certain types of people. They're interested in their Western clients. They're interested in their British nationals, US nationals. Are they interested in an Indian worker, not that much. No, they don't get that much coverage. Are they interested, uh, you know, and you have to look at each case. Is that person going to be able to attract the kind of media spotlight that would put enough pressure on 
the UAE government to release them. And to me, that is, I, I don't think that you could ever say that the country is hospitable if you're going into that kind of situation. Absolutely. And this is getting more and more interesting, more heated up. It's good. We're getting some interesting comments coming in. And we're going to pick up on this straight after the short break. And join us with Rada Sterling of Detained in Dubai. Binhaj Welfare Foundation mein aapka atiya zindagi ki ummeed aapki madad se mumkin hua duniya bhar mein 30 lakh se zayed khawateen buzurgon aur bachchon tak saaf pani ki frahmi mutasira ilaqon mein hangami imdad yatim aur besara bachchon ki dadrasi is saal hum aapke taawun se aur aage badhna chahte hain apni zakat sadqat aur khairat ke zariye in mansoobon ka hissa baniye अभी कॉल कीजिए जीरो थ्री हंड्रेड थ्री जीरो थ्री जीरो ट्रिपल सेवन या हमारी वेबसाइट विजिट करें डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट मिनहाज वेलफेयर डॉट ओग अमीगोज द सिग्नेचर नेम वेन इट कम्स टू बर्गर्स एंड शेक्स आर सर्किल बर्गर्स आर प्रिपेयर इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू वाइल यू वेट Whether you go for our 6-ounce Mexican or our 10-ounce Texan, or you decide to go for our messy fries or our buffalo wings, one thing you're guaranteed is quality. Dine in with your friends and family at 400 Cranbrook Road, Gants Hill, or order in on Uber Eats, Just Eat or Deliveroo. Amigos, hats off to great burgers. Turkish Kitchen, the best Turkish food you'll ever taste. We only use the highest quality meat. Along with our mixed grill platters, we serve cold mezes, hot mezes, lamagen, and a wide selection of fish options. To order for delivery or collection, call us now on 0208-507-8822. That's 0208-507-8822. Or visit us at 41 Ripple Road, Barking, ID 11 7NT. We can also take group bookings and take care of all your party needs. The Turkish Kitchen, Barking. If you want to advertise your business on Revive FM, then visit www.revivefm.co.uk or contact our sales team now on 07944-565616. That's 07944-565616. Advertise with Revive FM. The new NHS COVID-19 app shows me my risk of coronavirus and helps me protect my mum. It lets me know fast if I've been in contact with other app users who have coronavirus, so I can quickly warn Dan. It shows me the risk level in my area immediately, so I can tell Sue. It helps me protect all my loved ones, like Kim and Chris. The more of us who get the app, the better we can control coronavirus. Protect your loved ones. Get the NHS COVID-19 app. Download now at Google Play or the App Store. I came over from the Caribbean on my mother's passport in 1962. So when my right to live here was questioned, it broke me. I was afraid and to be honest, I was skeptical about calling the Windrush help team. But my husband persuaded me and I'm so glad I found the courage. The team have been really great. Now I've got the right documents and compensation too. It doesn't change what happened, but it helped. To find out if they could help you too, visit gov.uk forward slash Windrush Help Team. Minhad School of Islamic Sciences provides quality Islamic education for children aged between 5 and 15 years old, as well as teaching classical Islam, including Tajweed, Fiqh, Sira, and Aqidah. We endeavor to equip children with essential Islamic manners, morals, and values. Here at MSIS, our experienced teachers create an inspirational learning environment where we strive to cater for the needs of every child. For enrollment inquiries, Inquire in person at Minhaj School of Islamic Sciences, Monday to Friday, 5 to 7 p.m. at 292-296 Rumford Road or email admin.edu underscore london at minhajuk.org. Revive FM 94.0 On the radio On your mobile And online Welcome back to Revive FM and continuing our conversation this morning on The Breakfast Show. We're talking about the state of human rights and the state of justice, if justice can be achieved for those who are living in the Middle East and in particular a part of the world which has an image of glitz and glamour, of opportunity, the land of milk and honey for many from the Indian subcontinent. And our listeners, of course, would know several family members, or friends, colleagues, or at least a story of somebody, unfortunately, that has not had a great experience of being in the, in the emirati, emirati states, particularly in Dubai, which is heralded as 
almost like uh, the, the the America of of the East, in the sense that you can be anything you want, and the promise and the lure of the desert sands and high-rise skyscrapers can give opportunities. But having sp- spoken for the the most part of this hour with Radha Sterling, the CEO of Detainer Dubai, we're beginning to get a clearer picture of the realities. And whilst most of the mainstream media doesn't focus on it, and I'm going to ask Radha straight away about this, and it's actually mentioned, and you, you, you've actually tackled it yourself, and that is the part that where Western democracies pander to these emirati states. Um, just before I ask you in detail, I mean, let's clear a few things up because I'm getting some comments here. Um, the reality is when I talk about hospitality in traditional so-called Islamic countries, when you, when, you, when you hear about people who generally visit other countries, ladies and gentlemen, and they travel there and they go with, <laughs> with an aspiration of having enjoyment, the United Arab Emirates isn't top of the list. I'm talking about countries where uh, travel bloggers, travel journalists, um, and families go around the world. And if you see the response they get when they go to places, if I'm going to mention countries, you, there are several countries which happen to be um, so-called Islamic countries in terms of their culture, their um, their established traditions and, and their values. And people come away thinking, what a fabulous time we had, how lovely, how, how, how great that was. That's the point I was actually trying to make uh, in that I go to, I've been to Dubai with my family on many occasions. As a holiday, of course, you enjoy it because you're spending time with your family, you're spending quality time. I'm not involved in the, the day-to-day transactions and the day-to-day um, realities. But when you actually look at it, I, a person like myself, um, of Indian extraction, of Indian origin, born in India, raised in India, you question... That, hang on, <laughs> I don't want to come to a place where I see people of my national origin, heritage, not only being disparaged, but also being openly treated badly. It, you cannot but help walk away from a place like that and say, you know what, <laughs> I never want to go there again. And it's not because, of course, for family, for my enjoyment, for my pleasure to see family or friends or extended family, that's a separate issue. But on the case of a principal... You see workers, you see these, um, um, they're almost like bonded uh, workers who are working on those high construction, high, um, high rise construction sites without any health and safety precautions. And as, uh, as, our, as our guest here, Rather Sterling, has mentioned, their rights are not protected. But I'm just talking as an individual, regardless of where I'm from originally, well, the fact that I come back to, to London and, and there's, a, there's the vast disparity there and you can just switch off and go back into, into a mode where you can forget. But you cannot forget it because at the end you see that. And rather what I was going to ask you is, is there come some kind of shielding process, and you've raised it in, uh, uh, recently, where Western democracies are reluctant to call out these almost despotic regimes? Yeah, I, that, that's something that we always struggle with, actually, is, and, and particularly, of course, with this Israel deal, we're concerned that that's going to afford them even more protection to um, commit these human rights violations without consequence. And I, I did discuss with the FCO um, uh, quite, quite a number of years ago why it was that the UK was not doing anything as, as far as influencing the UAE to change or improve their, their conditions for people visiting the country. Because, I mean, yes, you can go there, as you said, as a tourist, as, as a family person and enjoy a holiday. But there's been a lot of cases of tourists and family men like Billy Barclay who have gone there on a holiday and wound up in an unbelievable situation that was completely unjust. And they've suffered a lot of trauma as a result. So there's, there's those cases as well. But I think um, the UK government hasn't stepped up very much and and nor has the US or any other countries until they're pressured and that is because of their trade deals that is because as they said to me as the SEO blatantly said to me that they do care more about their their trade deals their relationship with the country and the fact that the UAE is a security partner in the Middle East and their strongest ally 
okay, that's fair enough. But it doesn't have to come at the expense of our citizens. And it, it's the same with Canada. I mean, we've been dealing with the Canadian government on the case of on Andre Gortier at the moment. Now, all of the evidence in that case points to his innocence, and it's all documented, and the Emiratis have been provided with this documentation. And yet negotiations for, for his release are taking a long time. And why is that? I mean, six, eight months later, the Canadian government is still talking to their counterparts in the Emirates. And why aren't they a lot more aggressive with this case? And why, why are the Emirates pushing back so much? Well, it's because there's a Saudi... Uh, royal involved who happens to be benefiting financially from the fact that Andre Gautier is being um, kept in that country so that he can't talk about the laundering that actually happened in that case that involves a Saudi royal. So you have all of these dynamics going on. And if the Emirates really cares about these individuals, like I said earlier, um, that they care about pleasing these these royals or, or friends of royals, lower people, uh, they care about pleasing them, and they will fight with foreign governments for the right to do that. So, how how are these how are our countries incentivized to essentially stand up to the UAE and demand these improvements? That only comes from really making them accountable, because what they're looking for is an improved relationship with the UAE and with um, other Gulf nations. They're looking for, you know, improved diplomacy, improved security. But that balance um, has been highlighted, and I think that there is starting to be some kind of backhanded feedback on that. I mean, we had the UAE and, and Saudi, I mean, Saudi with the whole Hashoggi incident, and then we've had UAE um, attack a U.S. yacht in international waters, and we've had them now be exposed for um, a potential kidnapping in the United Kingdom. And what we're seeing with the UAE is an increased financial contribution and um, to lobbyist groups in uh, Washington, D.C. and in London. So that's really concerning because they're really trying to get involved in politics. They're really trying to get the support of the U.S. Um, to market to businesses. And then they're rallying up that support, but without offering those safeguards. And then, you know, it, it's organizations like mine that have to come and demand that from governments. And the way that we're doing that is making them accountable. And we've seen, you know, uh, the UAE has been a big abuser of Interpol's system, and that's resulted in some quite extreme human rights violations where Emiratis have just been able to make a phone call and say, put this guy on Interpol, I don't like him. And they've been able to do that. So when that is brought to the attention of a foreign government and they don't do something about it, if they don't warn their citizens or they don't demand some change, then that government themselves can become accountable for failing in their duty of care to protect citizens. So that kind of accountability in, in our local courts is important. But also we've seen the UAE has um, recently, and particularly in Ras al Khaimah actually, we're taking uh, litigations against um, third parties that the UAE has employed or instructed, and these are Western um, companies or individuals that the UAE has employed essentially to act against our citizens, that's British citizens, American citizens, uh, to act against them on behalf of the UAE. And those parties can certainly become accountable and they've been sued at the moment for facilitating these legal abuses and human rights abuses in the UAE, including torture. Um, then we have um, the UAE actually instructing security agents in Israel, in the US and in the UK to act against um, our citizens, British nationals and American uh, nationals and hack into their information sources and, and do all sorts of highly illegal um, actions against citizens. So they're now open to litigation. Uh, that the, the litigation combined with the lobbying of governments to force those changes does ultimately lead to those changes happening. And I think we just have to make sure that the new relationship with Israel, although it, it appears good, it's going to be overall benefit, but we have to ensure that we don't turn a blind eye to the human rights abuses that are happening in these countries and that we don't uh, prioritise that over the rights of individual citizens because then we're going to end up in a situation where the, the UAE and the relationship with Israel is bringing down our overall humanity in a sense.
That's fascinating stuff, Rada. We're going to go into a short break and then the news headlines. Rada, you're joining us after the news headlines, so please stay on. And we're going to pursue this in the next segment of the show, ladies and gentlemen. We'll talk about exactly what Rada just touched upon there is the, uh, the, the specter of Israel joining into the fray here, plus also a couple of things which many of our listeners are fascinated about in terms of this subject matter, which is the money launderers and the criminals who are hiding in the UAE away from the clasps of their domestic courts and justice system. Join us after the show break. Thank you. Welcome back to Revive FM and... Joining us after this uh, short break that we had with the the ads there, we've got so the CEO of Detain in Dubai, Ms. Radha Sterling. And in the first hour of the show, we've been talking about the realities of the Middle East, uh, the UAE in particular, and Dubai, um, which is the prime focus of the work of Radha in pursuing the rights and the interests of expat communities in particular who find themselves inadvertently on the wrong side of the laws and of the established international treaties which for most parts do not really hit the mainstream media and we touched upon something regarding that as Radha pointed out the the great collaboration between western democracies and the united arab emirates has been accelerated in part because of the strategic importance and as a natural political ally in the region. Now, um, now we're going to go into something which touches on this, but also, um, if we bring rather in into this, um, there's, there's other issues here, and pe- you know, I'm getting messages here which, uh, which pertain to the, to the realities that it's not just the rights of those uh, expats, etc., or other foreign nationals uh, in that part of the world, but also the basic rights of their own citizens, in particular um, the rights of, of women and the rights of, of those who are members of the um, LGBT community. And amongst the wave of culture and and the progress that other societies are trying to make, uh, particularly in Western democracies, and, the, and, and what we've seen here is, by all, by all means, not exactly a perfect reality, but progress is being made for many reasons, culturally, uh, politically, and through, through education, through, through a sense of understanding and learning of, of people understanding each other's differences as well as similarities. Now, in the, in the UAE, in Dubai in particular, um, I always hold this view that when people say, well, there's one law for that, well, the reality is, is, that, is that the basic rights of the, of, the, um, of the people that don't have a voice or people who are, are less capable um, are, are violated in general in how can I put it? In the eastern part of the world, and I, I go east of east of Greece, and uh, uh, primarily the Middle East, uh, Indian subcontinent, the Far East, and it's not just, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just the Islamic world in in inverted commas. However, it's highlighted because of the of the disparity, the great disparity, because those violations are embedded in laws. This is the whole point. This is the actual point. It's actually other, other countries which have um, human rights violations, and there's several. Um, we're talking also about Russia. We're talking about China. We're talking about several African states. We're talking about, if let's take it even further, we even talk about countries which you never even imagine have violated, and these are democracies such as India. Um, and they have to be called out whether they're democracies or not. But the very fact that some natural prejudices are always there, but where you've got laws enshrined and actually there to implement this kind of um, discrimination or victimization, that is where, unfortunately, the international media picks up on the fact that these happen to be um, Islamic countries, so-called Islamic states. Now, the... The, the interesting part when it comes to, to women's rights, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to weave this in, if you can see where I'm getting this, is that 
Um, there's been late, there was a, a, an interesting film called The Opposite of Sex, and that was about the life story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, an incredible individual, incredible lady, a fabulous um, advocate for human rights, uh, a great jurist, um, a Supreme Court judge, yet the filming brings to attention her life story where, in many ways, reflects a lot of the realities of what Eastern countries, uh, called Islamic countries, would always face regarding the, the treatment of women and where in 2020. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg encountered a discrimination in the United States where it was frowned upon. It was actually a surprise to know that she was going to be a law student at the prestigious law school at Harvard in the United States. And, and the chronicle of her battle and the chronicle of what she fought for, what she stood up for, is obviously legendary. But these are the kind of stories that need to be exemplified and, and shown in the Eastern world, because that struggle has existed everywhere. It's not just a problem for the East or for the Islamic societies, so to speak, but they are stories which are not heard of. But I was going to ask you, rather, because um, in many ways, in 2020, your life and your mission, in many ways, is kind of cemented primarily because of the efforts of people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Is there a possibility we could see a brother Sterling or someone similar from the East? Yes, yes. I mean, the thing is, we, we've seen, and as you've touched on just now, we've seen um, that there is a complete difference in opportunities for women and other minority groups in the UAE. Um, and, and the different way they're treated. I mean, we can see that Princess Latifah, for example, was not at all given the opportunities that her brothers have been given and she has zero rights. And then we're seeing that minority groups, as, as you said, LGBT community, of course it's unlawful, yes, it's an Islamic country, but the fact is that it's completely contradicting in nature to what we are sold. With, we, we can go onto the internet, if you're a gay person, for example, you go onto the internet and Dubai is full of this, you know, underground gay parties and they're not even that underground, they're, they're proper nightclubs, they're bars. It's, it's sort of accepted in theory, but in practice, you know, someone can end up being imprisoned. Um, as far as the women are concerned there, what we're seeing is they are being mistreated and that is evident by the number of people who are trying to escape and who have to escape. And yet we see a different level of women as well. We see them on the board of directors. We see them at, at conferences and we see them appearing to be equal to their male counterparts. But then at the same time, that's only because they happen to have been allowed to do that. And it's because they were fortunate enough to be in a family that, that hasn't constricted their freedom. And then again... As far as um, foreigners are concerned and as far as Indians being raised in the country, and there's a lot of Indians who were born in the UAE and who have lived their entire lives in the UAE, and this is another interesting thing, is that they can easily be kicked out of the UAE as well. We've had a lot of Indians who have uh, fallen foul of the law for whatever reason, and it could absolutely be a, a very small issue or it could be a business-related issue or, or just general living. Maybe they had trouble paying uh, their rent, and that's forced them to be um, deported, essentially, back to India. So they're arriving in India, a country that they've never lived and don't really have any network left because their, their family has always been in the UAE, and they're arriving back in a country that never lived at, say, 45 years old. So that kind of uh, situation can be very frustrating as well. So I think... I mean, we'll see how it evolves, but at the moment, we're, we're seeing that women... And, and certainly foreign women are going to be treated completely differently. If they go to complain, if they want to go and complain about their treatment, about discrimination or about abuse, even to the police, they risk themselves that they could end up um, at the other end of criminal charges for even making the complaint in the first place. Um, so this, this is the situation they're in, and it's a highly risky one. If we're seeing that 
women who are even at a royal level are being mistreated and complaining of uh, torture and abuse and human rights violations and being jailed without charge. If we're seeing it at that level, well, of course, someone who makes a complaint about their employer or sexual abuse or other abuses, of course, they're not going to be treated in in any um, normal manner as we would expect in the West, in any respectful manner. So if we're seeing it at the top level, we're going to see it at the bottom levels as well. Indeed. And the the other fact, and just to balance things up, uh, rather, um, obviously I asked you whether uh, th- there's a prospect of someone similar to yourself actually emerging in that part of the world um, in in protecting and defending the rights of, of people in general um, as a calling. Um, you've just mentioned something quite interesting, and that is is the, the, the realities of, of basic prejudice and the realities of of how women are treated. Now, in recent, in recent days, we've seen the emergence of uh, Kamala Harris in the United States, who is the vice presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And amongst, well, other than herself, you've got Nancy Pelosi, who is um, who's a speaker um, of the US Congress. And Prominent uh, individuals like that, and of course we had Hillary Clinton before, who who ran as the presidential candidate uh, for the Democrats in the last election. The incredible part is you have women of that stature and caliber, and they still get a, a stream of vitriol based primarily because they happen to be ladies, they happen to be women, and it's 2020, and it's in the United States, and 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 the recent uh, tirade of of um, criticism also extends to many high-profile um, businesswomen, uh, lawyers, jurors, etc. And the disrespect, I mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg for one reason, is because the disrespect shown to her is because she had one wish as part of her legacy is not to be seen, uh, to be disrespected in the sense that she wanted her successor to be, to be appointed after the next presidential election. And the U.S. President, uh, Mr. Donald Trump, um, categorically went against that. But it's the basic rights and respect of uh, of women, which we're seeing in, in the political sphere uh, in the United States, when positions of power are there. And just to balance things up, it's still not a rosy picture everywhere, rather. But, of course, the the realities of the East and the Middle East are totally different. Now, you touched upon um, the case of Princess Latifah. Now, I didn't, I didn't raise it because you, you mentioned it, but just to, just to let our listeners know, give us a little background of that. And also, I'm going to throw the other part in, which is the fact that Sheikh Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai, and one of the wealthiest individuals on the planet, an influential political figure in the, in the UAE, in the Middle East, he's also having marital troubles, is having legal troubles, and also a huge court case that has been initiated in the United Kingdom. Now, how is it, rather, because you'd know about this, how is it these things have landed up in London when actually it's the United Kingdom that we just discussed earlier is one of the closest allies of the Emirates? How has that all come into play? Yes, um, the Princess Hire case, and that that one's interesting because... um Latifa escaped in 2018, and this is actually why Sean Hannity uh, interviewed me um, that you you mentioned earlier. He was he was really interested in going into what this meant when the UAE actually attacked a US flagged yacht in international waters uh, to retrieve Princess Latifa, who by then was outside of the UAE jurisdiction and on board a US jurisdiction yacht. So. Sean Hannity was really interested in that as far as um, not not just the women's rights and the abuse of this woman who he um, yeah took a great interest in it, great interest in and so did so did the US in general which was really good but um, as far as the UAE feeling confident enough to attack a US yacht under under the pretense to abduct a woman um, now had that not come to the international media of course they would have got away with that and, and nothing would have happened. Um, but it, it did attract a lot of media attention and attract a lot of criticism. And Princess Hyer spoke on a radio interview uh, after that, and she was trying to calm things down. She was trying to calm the media down and saying that, well, actually, Latifah's okay. 
uh, she's fine. So that that was a, a little bit surprising that then six months or so later, we hear in the media that she's actually escaped herself. And in her initial radio interview, she said that if she thought for a moment that Latifa had been abused or that she had been you know, put in this horrible position, she said that she would leave the country. She wouldn't stay with Sheikh Mohammed. However, um, six months later, she turns up in the UK um, and now they're intertwined in a legal battle here. But that, that is what's happening is the, you, the, the world is becoming smaller as far as litigation is concerned. So, um, and, and that's hopefully going to influence that change that we're talking about as well. The fact that Princess Haya was able to initiate, well, Sheikh Mohammed initiated proceedings against her in the UK um, regarding the children for custody of the children. Now, because he chose to do it in the UK, where she was at the time, the UK would accept that jurisdiction and the legal battle continues here. Now, the, the good thing about uh, the UK being a little bit of a, a jurisdiction hub is that things that are happening or have happened in the UAE are finally being brought to a legal forum that we can mostly trust. Um, Whereas before, all of these matters, for example, if, if someone goes to the UAE, they end up in legal trouble there and they have to leave the country because if they stay in the country, they, they might be put in jail unfairly or, you know, they're definitely not going to get a fair hearing, a fair trial or uh, civil justice through the courts there. But if they can establish jurisdiction in the UK or in the US and take a legal action against um, the, the opposition in this jurisdiction, it affords them that access to potential justice. So, I mean, that, that's the good thing about what's happening with Princess Haya and several other cases, but quite, it's quite a new concept, um, trying to seek justice on a UAE matter outside UAE. But if we do that, if we're able to continue to do that, the fact that we can seek that justice and potentially get awarded compensation or other sorts of remedies that may force the UAE to change and improve their system. And I, I guess uh, part of that, rather, is is obviously something that your um, uh, your organisation is is constantly battling. And judging by the way that you are you're tackling the authorities head on, and and uh, just to give an idea for our listeners to know that to actually enter into a dialogue with um, with uh, with any kind of authority or institu institution in the Middle East, in particular the UAE, and we've had it on many times on our show when we've invited guests to speak on several issues, uh, actually to do with um, uh, lifestyle issues about trade, commerce, the emergence of, uh, of, of, of a wider um, international business uh, community, and, and this is going over months and months, particularly on this show, and, and people refuse to talk to us. I guess there is that kind of censorship and there is also somebody always looking over their shoulders so they are not only wary of what they're going to say, they're actually, in many cases, um, sanctioned for what they say. So there is that part as well. Um, rather, I just... Uh, we're just going to go on a short break in, in an under a minute. I just want to ask you something before we go into the, into the break and then and and talk about what I highlighted at the, big, at the top of the hour, which was discussing about the criminals in uh, in the UAE in that factor. Um, where do you see the, your dialogue with the institutions? How is that? Just give us 20, 30 seconds, uh, if you can, please, before we go into the short break. How is your dialogue with the institutes institutions there? Yeah, we're working a lot with the US, Australia and UK government. We've been uh, working with Senate and providing white papers and, and research papers to them to help them make better decisions. I think they're very cooperative and I think that they have changed their tune and they are starting to really care about the rights of the individuals. Thank you so much. And let's go into break. And then after the break, we're going to join our headline guest, Rather Sterling, CEO of Detainment Dubai. And we're going to talk about those criminals that are seeking sanctuary. If you want to advertise your business on Revive FM, then visit www.revivefm.co.uk or contact our sales team now on 07944 565616. That's 07944 
5616. Advertise with Revive FM. Super Best Meze Grill, the Turkish restaurant where all our food is prepared to perfection. Our mixed grill family platters include lamb shish, chicken shish, adana kebab, lamb ribs, chicken donna, lamb donna, chicken wings and lamb chops. And all are served with rice, salad, along with a selection of our cold mezes. To see our full menu, go to superbestmezegrill.co.uk. For the perfect dining setting, visit us now at 21 to 23 Broadway Stratford E15 4B or call 0208 555 335. Super Best Meze Grill. I came over from the Caribbean on my mother's passport in 1962. So when my right to live here was questioned, it broke me. I was afraid and to be honest, I was skeptical about calling the Windrush help team. But my husband persuaded me and I'm so glad I found the courage. The team have been really great. Now I've got the right documents and compensation too. It doesn't change what happened, but it helped. To find out if they could help you too, visit gov.uk forward slash Windrush help team. Did you know that girls like Nura walk an average of three miles every day in search of clean water to support their families? Minhaj Welfare Foundation believes you can end the water crisis by building small and large-scale water projects. Your charity is helping improve the lives of communities living in the poorest regions of the world. However, more needs to be done. Support Water for All. Donate today. Call us now. 0300-3030-777 or visit us on minhajwelfare.org. Minhaj School of Islamic Sciences provides quality Islamic education for children aged between 5 and 15 years old. As well as teaching classical Islam including Tajweed, Fiqh, Sira and Akida, we endeavor to equip children with essential Islamic manners, morals and values. Here at MSIS, our experienced teachers create an inspirational learning environment where we strive to cater for the needs of every child. For enrollment Enrollment inquiries, inquire in person at Minhaj School of Islamic Sciences, Monday to Friday, 5 to 7 p.m. at 292-296 Rumford Road or email admin.edu underscore london at minhajuk.org. If you're looking for a unique bespoke cake made especially for your big day, then look no further. Here at Sugar Sprinkle Cakery, we design some of the most imaginative and delicious home-baked cakes for your special occasions. We do fresh cream, buttercream, eggless and vegan cakes. Check us out on Instagram or Facebook at Sugar Sprinkle Cakery or just call 07932 that's 07932-665-833. I wash my hands to protect my family. I wear a face covering to protect my mates. I make space to protect my colleagues. Hands. Face. Space. I wash my hands to protect strangers. I wear a face covering to protect other passengers. I make space to protect you. Hands. Face. Space. As we spend more time indoors, we need to do whatever we can to help protect each other from coronavirus. So please, wash hands, cover face, make space. Revive FM. 94.0. On the radio. On your mobile. And online. Welcome back to Revive FM. And getting straight into the action, I'm going to bring in uh, our guest, uh, Ms. Radha Sterling, CEO of Detainment Dubai. And... A lot of our listeners, fascinated by this subject matter, it's been something people from the uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent diaspora are amazed by, and that is, and I'm going to ask you straight away right then, what your experiences and the realities of the very fact that Dubai provides a safe haven for known money launderers, um, racketeers, and in some cases, blatant... Thieves, in the words of the Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, who vowed on an anti-corruption drive to bring back these thieves, in his words, which not only reside in the Middle East, but also particularly in Dubai, sheltering not only there, but also funneling and laundering a lot of the money, which doesn't belong to them in in some cases belongs to the state of India and the case of their neighbour as well, Pakistan, whose Prime Minister had a similar anti-corruption drive where he also vowed to bring back those who'd looted public funds and public money. The two very different leaders of those countries 
actually had an anti-corruption platform in which they actually which they got elected the the realities are different of course because they have to pander in in both their countries to um a, a religious extremist element which holds them to ransom but that's a separate issue let's not talk about that uh, ladies and gentlemen let's talk about the reality of what their anti-corruption drive has been and that is to pinpoint and target the criminals in some cases in india's case the underworld masterminds of several atrocities terrorist attack which have not only hampered and damaged communal relations in the indian subcontinent but also causes friction with their neighbor because the bigger picture has been how the media and how the people respond to the fact that some countries shelter these wanted criminals rather in the united kingdom we've got something known as the unexplained wealth order which is just just sort of kicking off and i i listened to um another radio show a couple of days ago where um, the head of that um, organization has said that 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 sort of um, element of enforcement has only just started in the United Kingdom. Is there any chance of that ever happening in somewhere like Dubai to go after, say, wanted terrorists, known underworld kingpins, what Indian called dons in inverted commas, particularly from Mumbai, who have a one-hour journey maximum going from Dubai and Mumbai secretly in what's known as another haven for terrorists and criminals who reside in Dubai and frequent another place, uh, which is Pakistan, for example, under the cover of anonymity and darkness. Is that ever going to happen, rather? Are we just going to have bad news for people from the Indian subcontinent to say, sorry, we can't go after these criminals? Well, that, that will happen if um, other countries care enough to make it happen. So, I mean, the U.S. is very aware of the, the laundering that's taking place in the UAE, that Turkey and Saudi have used the UAE um, explicitly as a, as a destination, but there's also potential violations um, of, of Iran sanctions between Ras al Khaimah and Iran. And th there's a lot going on. But the bottom line is that the, the U.S. doesn't care. And, of course, the U.S., as the UAE's biggest partner, doesn't care enough to say, OK, this has to stop. This is not on. It's not acceptable. As, as soon as that happens, then we'll see it change. But for the moment, uh, the U.S. is prioritizing other interests above the harboring of criminals and, and money laundering. They're, they're valuing more the relations, the Israel deal, which uh, obviously is valuable, um, but they're valuing, you know, the security agreements and all sorts. It's a growing relationship. So they've had to prioritize that, or they have prioritized it anyway. And we'll probably see, and I, I discussed this at the offshore alert forum in Miami, and actually there was an FBI agent who asked me very much the same question. Is this ever going to change? Why are we allowing the UAE to be this laundering hub? And um, the simple reason is, well, the simple reason that it's still a money laundering hub is because we're not prioritizing that. We don't see that as the biggest issue with our relationship with the UAE. Now, as far as India is concerned, um, when Sheikh Latifa was taken from the yacht, that was with Indian cooperation. And within just a couple of days of that incident and their great assistance to the UAE, and collaboration in abducting Sheikh Latifa from the yacht. We saw uh, several extraditions from the UAE back to uh, India. So it looks like that was um, some kind of a quo pro deal and that, um, that that relationship has developed. But the issue with that is, yes, okay, India is being able to extradite a couple of people back to the country. But at what cost? because now we're going to see the UAE wanting that same reciprocation from India, and that's where we see that Indians are going to face some serious um, human rights violations, because we have a lot of Indians who have fled the country, they've been forced to flee the UAE because of false allegations or because of um, the economy going bad, and because the economy goes bad, their business goes down, and then they end up defaulting, they end up being listed falsely, wrongfully, on Interpol as fraudsters or embezzlers, even though they're not, and even even though it's just, you know, a company that's gone bad. And, and in any other country, they would simply go bankrupt. But in the UAE, uh, they, they can't do that. So they go back to India, the UAE puts them on Interpol, 
and list them as a fraudster or an embezzler, and then they're pressuring. And I can see this increasing because I've got a lot of Indian clients um, that have been listed on Interpol, and I can see the pressure coming because of this deal that India's been making with the UAE. And the UAE is pressuring India. They say, you know, you haven't historically taken our Interpol notices seriously, and now we can see India stepping up, and they're actually, you know, hunting people down. They're actually going to their... Uh, houses and, and looking for them and, you know, potentially extraditing them back to the UAE. And if they do, we're going to see a lot of Indians being sent back to the UAE and jailed for crimes that are not crimes in India. And that's a real problem, and I don't think it's worth it at this point. I mean, the case, uh, rather, just to um, um, exempt, uh, sort of explain to our listeners, the case of Princess Latifa is is extraordinary because she was traveling on her yacht uh, in presumably in the safety um, of, her, of her environment where she had uh, security officials and guards who were protecting her and her personal staff yet it was the it was the Indian Navy the Indian special forces that intercepted um, her on the high seas and that is the part which is puzzling because a princess can only be intercepted once there have been there has been a sort of an arrangement, presumably by her father, um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, of uh, of Dubai, who must have actually. And this is great. Uh, there's a lot of speculation in the media, in the mainstream media, that a personal request was made to India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to actually intercept and to do it basically a deal in that get my daughter um, back to me and in return I'm going to help you in, in, in not so in, in blatant terms to do and catch whoever you want to catch this kind of trade deal and the way that's done obviously doesn't put India in a, in a very good light at all it's it's almost reminiscent of, of a similar of a similar kind of trade-off and I hope that gets resolved rather is 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 the is the famous case of um, uh, an ongoing um, uh, sort of struggle to get uh, personnel from the United States and diplomats who've committed um, offences in the United Kingdom and getting them back to face the music, which is not so easy either. So we can understand um, the realities of, of trade-offs, but in this case where the United Kingdom is looking for extradition for one of the US diplomats to come and face trial in the United Kingdom because the diplomat inadvertently um, managed to, by reckless driving, killed um, uh, a British citizen. That hasn't happened. And the mainstream media is not jumping up and down about it. These things don't hold governments in good light, rather. And the reality is, if standards are meant to be sort of upheld, shouldn't standards be consistent at least? With Britain, for example, rightly looking for some kind of justice for the family who encountered this incident where a US diplomat fled the country upon um, causing, well, basically it's, it's uh, manslaughter by reckless driving. And that was just last, just in the last couple of years. Are international standards important, rather, or would that not make a difference to places like Dubai? Well, it's interesting. I mean, diplomatic immunity has been a problem for us in, in trying to seek justice for people as well in the U.S. Um, we've had clients who have tried to uh, take actions in New York against um, various members of the ruling family in the UAE, and they haven't been able to. And... I mean, that, that's a real difficulty because it gives them a license to essentially do whatever they want and uh, and then it's open to exploitation. Now, there, there's these, these people in the UAE, these royals, they're deliberately doing these certain actions knowing that they have that protection. Now, this woman who um, accidentally uh, hit the teenager in the UK and, and went back to the US and they won't extradite her, well, obviously, you know, she didn't intend to do that. That was not a deliberate murder. I don't think anyone's saying that it was. But in, in these cases, when we're dealing with Emiratis, they're acting in business and they're committing these certain crimes knowing that they can't be sued, that they can't be um, taken to court abroad, 
and that they can essentially do what they want and they're acting with that in mind and that's when it becomes real difficulty. Now, as far as India is concerned with... It seems strange to me that they would breach international law and actually take um, Princess Latifah from a yacht outside of their waters. Now, had she entered the jurisdiction of India, that's a different story. They would have to push her through normal um, courtroom procedures, which would perhaps be extradition if the UAE wanted to accuse her of a crime. But she would have those protections within the... should have those protections within the Indian law. Freed her from international waters is even more concerning because it means if they're willing to do that, if they're willing to just go and pluck someone from a yacht in international waters, who is safe? Um, I, I could be sailing the sea anywhere in the world and any country technically could come in and retrieve me from a yacht and that's no... That, I mean, that's a huge thing and I don't think it was taken seriously enough by governments. Um, the FBI investigated it, we alerted the... Um, authorities in the US, the authorities in the UK, and it was really hush-hushed. You know, it, it was covered up. And was, was there any ramification to India? Was there any recourse legally? Not so far, no. And it's something we're exploring. But definitely, if India is willing to breach international law, there should be some kind of sanction, some kind of punishment, some kind of um, law court open to take action against them. And I remember when this happened, because I was called from the yacht during the attack. And I was contacting the Indian Coast Guard, Indian authorities. I was genuinely worried. I didn't know that it was the Indian government who attacked the yacht. I thought, you know, maybe it was pirates. And the Indian Coast Guard was completely silent to me. No matter how many times I contacted them to report the loss of this yacht or the disappearance of this yacht, uh, they were completely silent. So no one knew what was going on. And it was only by the fact that we were able to trace this yacht um, just on some technology that they'd forgotten to turn off but we wouldn't have known what had happened. And that, to me, you know, that is shocking behaviour. And I spoke to the Indian media about it as well. They weren't happy. They weren't happy that Modi had essentially sacrificed this um, poor princess who was claiming she was tortured and everything else. It basically sacrificed her in order to facilitate the extradition of several people that would help him politically, he thought. Um, but it's just not worth it. When, when you start sacrificing people like that, I think the extradition treaty wasn't worth it. And that he could have negotiated that privately anyway without the Sheikh Latifah favour. I don't think that was necessary. India is a very powerful country. The dependent on their labour, their skills. I mean, it's the single largest population group in the UAE. So they're in a very powerful position and they certainly don't need to be doing favours that put them in such a horrible position and with such criticism of the international community. And of course, you, know, you were uh, pivotal in that, uh, rather, uh, in, in bringing this to the attention of the mainstream media. Um, but the, the other interesting part, fascinating part, is the yacht uh, was actually carrying an American flag, which means that Dubai and India had inadvertently attacked an American flag carrier vessel in international waters and then maritime law uh, for anyone uh, who's, who's uh, up to speed with it this basically is a great insult to u.s sovereignty in essence um uh, this is this is the other part which is also interesting is that they say there was a trade-off for the fact that princess latifah was taken in exchange for a con well it's reported in, in, in several news outlets, in, including um, a Blitz magazine, which reportedly said that a controversial arms dealer, Christian Michael, was extradited from the UAE and India was desperately seeking for getting this, uh, uh, this controversial figure. And they couldn't find any headway uh, as the UAE authorities weren't agreeing to India's request for extraditing the British arms dealer. And this, unfortunately, seems to have been the trade-off. Um, rather, is there any... Any mileage to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seemed very obvious that as soon as the uh, Sheikh Latifa abduction was facilitated, within just a few hours, there were phone calls being made between the two, uh, between Modi and Sheikh Mohammed. So, yeah, that was. it appears that that was absolutely the deal. And it wasn't just him. There were extraditions again within just a few weeks. So it was really a move that solidified the relationship. And I'm sure that the fact that it went public, and I don't think they expected it to go public. I think they expected it to be very quiet, hush-hush. The fact that it did go public and 
you know, we raised it in the international media and documentaries and all sorts of things meant that Modi would have benefited from that. He would have been able to say to Sheikh Mohammed, you know, we've suffered a lot of criticism because of this. And, uh, and that would have potentially solidified their relationship a little bit more. It's just, it's a really bold, blatant, you know, attack, really. On, on the U.S., and as you say, it's a U.S. yacht. It's, it had a U.S. citizen on board and who was forcibly taken back to the UAE with India's assistance. Now, that kind of bold act against the West is exactly what the West needs to stand up against because if they say yes to this, if they say this is okay and these countries go unsanctioned, it really is going to increase, and especially with you know peace and, and with Israel and everything else, they're just going to feel perhaps more emboldened to commit these acts against us until we say no more. Indeed, and uh, I think we're going to, after we go into a short break like that, and to close um, this very fascinating interview we've had with you, we're going to talk about exactly that, the normalization with Israel, and as, to quote you, um, you stated, the normalization with Israel must not lead to greater impunity for the UAE, and let's talk about that just after the short break. Thank you. ये आयशा है ये बहुत छोटी सी थी जब इसके वालिद का एक हादसे में इंतकाल हो गया वो अपनी माँ और छोटे बहन भाइयों के साथ रहती है आयशा जैसी लाखों बच्चियाँ जिंदगी की बुनियादी सहूलतों से बिल्कुल महरूम है यही वजह है कि वो स्कूल भी नहीं जा सकती मिनहाज वेलफेयर फाउंडेशन ने आपकी एहतियात और अपनी खिदमत दुनिया भर के यतीम और बेसहारा बच्चों के लिए वक्फ कर दी है एक यतीम और बेसहारा बच्चे का सहारा बनी आज ही अतिया कीजिए अभी कॉल मिला जीरो थ्री हंड्रेड थ्री जीरो थ्री जीरो ट्रिपल सेवन या हमारी वेबसाइट विजिट करें डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट मिनहाज वेलफेयर डॉट ओग Rosier Plumbing, the boiler specialists. We do new boiler installations, full house central heating systems, underfloor heating, boiler repairs, boiler servicing and gas safety certification for landlords. With some of the best prices in town, there's no job too big or too small for our qualified engineers. For a free no obligation quote, contact us now on 07956282948. Rosier Plumbing, the boiler specialists. Turkish kitchen The best Turkish food you'll ever taste. We only use the highest quality meat. Along with our mixed grill platters, we serve cold mezes, hot mezes, lamagen, and a wide selection of fish options. To order for delivery or collection, call us now on 0208 507 8822. That's 0208 507 8822. Or visit us at 41 Ripple Road, Barking, ID 11 7NT. We can also take group bookings and take care of all your party. Needs the Turkish Kitchen Barking. If you want to advertise your business on Revive FM, then visit www.revivefm.co.uk. Alternatively, contact our sales team now on 07944565616. That's 07944565616. 07944565616. Nitro Treats. The dessert lab where your treats are formulated before your very eyes. Keep cool with our flavored shaved ice, or chill out with our exclusive Dragon Breath Nitro ice creams. Experiment with our selection of mojitos, or indulge in our traditional faludas or lassies. Visit Nitro Treats at 210 Ilford Lane, where our nitrologists remain ready to serve. Nitro Treats. It's Nitro. Looking to get your finances in order? MR Accountants has you covered. We provide a full range of accountancy and taxation services, including annual and management accounts, self-assessment tax returns, VAT, bookkeeping, and payroll services. We ensure you're kept up to date with the latest legislation, and our client-focused approach helps us plan your business finances from savings to investments. We are MR Accountants. Visit our website at mraccountants.com or call us on 0203 432 9. Kebabish Original, one of the biggest names in the restaurant trade. Visit your local KO to experience the thrill of the grill and the most authentic Pakistani cuisine. From our kebabs to our curries and from our mixed platters to our peri-peri, our chefs prepare your food in front of you while you wait. KO is now offering franchise opportunities. To take advantage of our proven and successful business model, contact us on 0208-446-7779 or visit kebabishoriginal.co.uk. Revive FM 94.0 On the radio On your mobile And online 
Welcome back to Revive FM. And in the last quarter of the hour, the breakfast show here on 94.0 is our headline guest, Ms. Wada Sterling, CEO of Detain in Dubai. And we've had a very interesting uh, discussion this morning. And to round off things this morning, let's, let's talk about the real progress or the potential progress that can be made with the Abraham Accord, which has been signed by Israel and the United Arab Emirates alongside Bahrain. And the speculation is other countries will be joining, including um, Oman, and has been mooted Saudi Arabia. Now, that would be a game-changer in the sense of the geopolitical scene in the Middle East as a, as a whole. But that's... We'll touch upon that on future future shows, ladies and gentlemen. But on on this particular topic, and um, we raised the the spectre of of the UAE being a shelter and being uh, a safe haven uh, one time for known criminals, uh, money launderers, um, state racketeers, and terrorists. But the tide is gradually changing and we discussed uh, just earlier with uh, with Rada that whilst laws are being followed in terms of extradition in well c- countries such as India is actively uh, hunting down criminals as part of a kind of trade off with 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 favors being done by both parties but in pursuit of that other laws are being broken the case of the princess latifa where in in international waters um, she was apprehended and many reports suggest on the personal interception of her father Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai and the Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi did a trade-off in in that and whilst that doesn't hold India in any any favorable light whatsoever to put into context we're looking at something known as the 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 potential progress of the UAE and, and the Middle East with regards to this trade deal with Israel and and rather you 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 commented something very interesting um, which I stated just before the break and you said normalization with Israel must not lead to greater impunity for the UAE now just to give a a little background, rather. You obviously you've worked very closely with Interpol, and just for our listeners, Interpol issues something known as a, a red notice, um, which basically has a list of wanted individuals who, should they basically set foot in certain countries, Interpol has a, a database in which they are required to be apprehended. There are certain countries where, if these individuals on that particular list are shielded and do not. Um, have uh, have access to being apprehended, they can live quite comfortably under the radar. Now, the surprising thing, and which we're going to ask Rather about, is the reality is which countries actually implement these Interpol red notices and actually act on them. Now, the reality is, if you look at the the website for Interpol and look at the red notices and the the amount of uh, of criminals and wanted uh, fugitives, a third of those actually emanate from Russia. And this is an interesting part as well. But let's focus on the part which uh, we're going to round off the show with, and that is the concept of, a, of probably the Middle East's only democracy, Israel, shaking hands with known, th- in some cases, theocracies, but also non-democratic regimes uh, and what hope is there as you said rather normalization with israel must not lead to greater impunity for the uae can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by that and also in the context of for example would israel implement the fact that you've got interpol red notices out there from known fugitives could normalization with israel bring in some of the accepted practices of what the state of israel is accustomed to and will that kind of filter in or just by osmosis permeate into uae society yeah that, that's an interesting point and one i was going to touch on as well is that i think we will see a little greater impunity and the media is going to be less 
wanting to criticize the UAE in light of the fact that I think the perception will be with Israel allying with the UAE, I think that we're going to see by extension that we are further allied with the UAE and that they are more our friends just because of that relationship. So I think that's the danger when I say that this could embolden them to feel that they can act with further impunity, that they are going to be less criticised by the international media, particularly in the US and in Washington, where we have a lot of Israelis and Israeli-sponsored media who's going to be less likely to want to criticise the regime. Um, however, on the, on the other on the other side of that, we're, we're already seeing that the UAE is um, trying to get that investment and get people from Israel, getting entrepreneurs, investors and businesses to open their doors in the UAE. They've just sent a special uh, force over to, to Israel to market to them. They see them as absolutely new market, more money. Um, so they're really going to be aiming for that. And in doing that, we're going to see these people, these Israelis, go and open their businesses. It's new to them. Their own media hasn't covered a lot of what you know the, the British and American media has covered, which are these risks to entrepreneurs, risks to business people, and risks to tourists. So I think they're going to be quite new to it. And I think naively, they're going to go to the UAE and they are going to open a business there. It's exciting. It's new. And they're, they're going to invest, and then ultimately they're still going to end up in the same situations that we've been talking about for the past 10 years. So they're going to end up uh, with allegations against them, with false allegations, or you know they're going to end up in a, a situation where they've been arrested without charge, or that their business is stolen, their money is stolen. And that's going to hit the Israeli media finally, and I think they've been very sheltered over the past decade. No one, you know, Israelis are not travelling to the UAE, so the media didn't have that much of an interest. And I think that in Israel, at least, and we've already uh, covered a lot of these risks in their local um, media, I think that um, as soon as the UAE arrests some Israelis, and they're in the honeymoon period now, so they're going to be very careful... They're probably, the police are probably under instructions, do not prosecute Israelis at the moment. Um, but that honeymoon period is going to be over and they're going to come in, do business, and some local Emirati is going to take, take a police case against one of them and they're going to be arrested. And that's when we're going to see the Israeli media really cover the risks of the UAE and they're going to criticise the UAE. And that sort of relationship with Israel might actually lead to that change being implemented in the UAE because I think the Israelis are going to be very, very noisy, perhaps noisier than the British and the Americans when one of their persons is wrongly persecuted, coming from you know a dem democratic country um, with, with a legal system that's superior to the UAE. I think that they're going to really demand that change if Israelis are going to invest because they're already cautious. So at the sign of any risk or any, you know, Israeli who's going to be jailed over there, I think that that's going to come with a powerful force and a powerful message to the UAE that if they don't change their laws, well, actually, Israel, yes, we have this deal, but we're not going to give you our money, we're not going to give you our business. And I think with with that in mind, rather, I think it's uh, clearly fascinating, fascinating era that we're living in. Um, unfortunately, we're still under the cloud of of the ongoing pandemic yet the middle east is proving to be a fascinating um part of the world where d bereft of any other stories really that are hitting the headlines in europe and in, in north america and canada apart from of course the the presidential election that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks this this part of the world we feel here and revive the fam anyway we've been we've been kind of building up to this because it's a it's it's a topic which I think what we're going to see in the next couple of months, in particular going forward, and I spoke to somebody the other day, said, well, you know, is there anything to talk about with the Middle East? I said, of course there is. Of course there is. It's news. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's like any product. You have, to, you have to talk about what people want to hear about. People want to hear about the Middle East. People are intrigued. People do follow it. So, um, rather, I think um, we'll be following... Uh, your progress and your endeavours with Detain in Dubai. And we'd just like to thank you so much for joining us as our headline guest. It's been a real pleasure and a privilege to, to interview you today on Revive FM. So thank you for that. And we'll just leave you on a final note. Um, so over to you, Radha. 
thank you. Thank you very much for having me on your show. It's been a real pleasure. Great. And uh, listeners, join us next week. Have a peaceful weekend. And catch you next week on The Breakfast Show on Revive FM. Thank you.